your first psychedelic experience was it it was in germany right when you were studying there and it was in a clinical That's right. kind of research yeah. setting uh, a mere 57 years ago <laughs> <laughs> and that was with psilocybin well, it, was, uh, it was psilocybin yeah and uh uh, completely unexpected, and as uh, described in my book, it really kind of uh, um, focused my life in many ways, or uh, uh, paved the way for uh, my career since. Yeah, there's a really wonderful description of, of the experience. Um, I toyed with, with reading it out here because it's, it's one of the best... Um, you know, kind of prototypical descriptions of a psilocybin experience, but I'll, I'll let people go buy your book, Sacred, Med, uh, Sacred Knowledge, to uh, to read that passage. Um, but you, you describe um, it, it precipitating a kind of mystical experience, right? This kind of classic, unitive, yes. feeling, kind of one with the universe. Perhaps you could tell us a bit about how you define and think about the mystical experience. Yeah. Well, one thing that uh, impresses me uh, when I um, put on the hat of the scholar is that that young 23-year-old guy in Germany who received the psilocybin uh, hadn't even heard the word psychedelic yet, you know? I, he didn't know what psilocybin was. And his mental set uh, was uh, that uh, he might, get some insights into early childhood because they were working with very low dosage in a psychoanalytic framework. And it was almost like either you're going to get panicked and paranoid because there was no supportive set or setting in those days, or you, you might get a glimpse of uh, early regression into childhood. But no one had told me that this could have anything to do with spirituality or religious life. And um, what happened, you know, was incredibly profound spiritually. And uh, so I was one very amazed young man, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think and, that's... Uh, um... It's amazing, as you say, like, the, I think in the 50s, when people were initially looking into it as whether it mirrored psychosis, right, they would give it to people telling them, this is going to make you go crazy. For some people, it did. But for some people, for a lot of people, they had spiritual experiences. So it's amazing the power of these substances, as you say, in a paradigm where everyone's thinking about psychoanalysis, no one's telling you this is going to precipitate right. anything religious, yet it, yet it can still happen. Yeah, yeah, the psychiatrist in overseeing the research at that time in Göttingen was Hans Karl Leuner. And he had just written a book, a monograph called The Experimental Psychosis, The Experimental Psychosis. And the mental set was that these drugs would help us understand schizophrenia better, you know. Uh, but there was no thought that they might be uh, uh, therapeutically potent or truly revelatory of uh, human consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And so what was that like then? The um, <clears throat> do you recall that the um, the mystical experience you had then? Did it have the kind of the classic features that you've gone on to kind of quantify in your in your research of kind of unity and sacredness and all the rest? Yes. Yeah. The uh, in unity, transcendence of time and space, uh, intuitive knowledge, uh, sacredness, deeply felt positive mood, and of course, ineffability and right. paradoxicality. It's very hard to put it into language. Yeah. yeah. And then, so I think a lot of people, as you say, they have this, so they enter a, a psychological space that is ineffable can't be described with words it's kind of beyond concepts right beyond symbols beyond all the words we say about it just i think you um in you described in, in your book how you wrote down in german reality is which i feel like is a really good summary of that intuitive <laughs> knowledge right period it doesn't matter what you think about it <laughs> right it doesn't matter what you say about it what you think about it yeah i think that's when when you say um you know if if uh 
someone who's never experienced this kind of thing and only understands <clears throat> gaining knowledge through reading books and talking and that kind of knowledge, it may sound strange to someone to say you can have profound intuitive knowledge, but I think there's this kind mm -hmm. of, you also talk about, you know, in, in your kind of normal everyday consciousness, you reread reality is, and it sounds trivial. It's like, well, of course I know that, but it's, it's almost, yeah, that's, that's why I think you can have these intuitions. They're so simple that you just get it, but they're also so incredibly profound, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there is something about these uh, mystical transcendental states that feel more more real, more fundamental uh, than the, the state of consciousness we're in right now. And um, uh, you know, you could argue it's one big delusion but it's one that many, many people uh, share. And uh, people often describe it as uh, waking up or homecoming or like almost a sense of uh, I've been in this place before or I've been connected to this place before somehow and forgot it. And uh, in theological language, that's overcoming the estrangement it's uh, really awakening to the spiritual dimension of our lives you know Teilhard de Chardin's line that we're all spiritual beings having physical experiences right now but we forget that <laughs> you know and this kind of reawakens us to uh, my gosh we really are spiritual beings you know yeah yeah, we really are at home in the universe. This really is, you know, we're made of this stuff and it's, yeah, it's, we're at home. Um, I think that's, I hadn't heard that term estrangement used in theological uh, terms before, but that sounds really interesting because, you know, I think the idea of reality is in the present moment being more profound or more real than when you're living in, you're constantly thinking, oh, what am I going to do in the future? Or you're living in memories. It's easy, you know, this is where Buddhist philosophy and modern psychology all come together to say, well, actually, meditation and being in the present moment really is more real than living in these, these thoughts. And so I guess in a kind of Buddhist framework, you might say you're normally in delusion if you're, if you're identified with thoughts. Um, and so I went, is, that, is that kind of maybe a parallel there between delusion in, the, in Buddhism and estrangement in this kind of theological language? Um... Well, theologically, and I, I don't pretend to be a theologian at, <laughs> at this point in my life, uh, but the concept of sin is separation. Mm -hmm. It's forgetting. Uh, and it doesn't have to be guilt-ridden. It's simply uh, fallen, fallen from the eternal world into the temporal world. So these experiences reconnect you, reawaken you to the reality of the, the spiritual dimension. You know? Right. Yeah, and, it uh, seems with these substances And they're might well, be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, beauty is another part of this, right? I think that's one of the, um, when you talk about <clears throat> the different kinds of intuitive knowledge people gain, the idea that beauty is somehow more true than, than, the, the kind of mundane way we, we tend to see the world that is some way intrinsic to existence um, and also the idea that consciousness exists beyond the ego, beyond the self, right? I think these are some of the intuitions you talk about. Yeah, I'm quite fond of the uh, concept in Zen, as I understand it, that the eternal world, if you will, is not just uh, before birth and after death but it's also a portal right in the middle of the present moment. If we can really be centered and really wake up and there's meditative techniques that can move us in that direction and all kinds of other uh, technologies of altering consciousness. But the psychedelics are one very potent, reliable tool to uh, facilitate that awakening yeah that's definitely something um 
it, that one can experience with a, a variety of different methods, as you say, I think, you know, as, as long as you, in the present moment, if, if the thoughts of the future drop away and memories of the past, you're right, the, the present moment opens up into, it loses the sense of time and, as being this linear thing. And suddenly you're here in the eternal now that is always, where, wherever anything's happening, it's happening in the now, right? So yeah, I love that idea of the present moment being a portal into the, the kind of the infinite or the eternal aspects of, of being. Yeah. I feel like so this your is... heart, your heart can beat and your lungs can breathe while you have a mystical experience, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is kind of nice, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, you, and then you spend the rest of your life integrating it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It can really, as you say, I mean, for you, it, it set your your the direction of the rest of your life, um, and I would, yeah, I would say. For me, my, my first kind of spontaneous mystical experience is what, what set the direction of my life as well. It's incredible that in an, mm. in an instant or a few hours, you know, someone can just awake to something so um, seemingly profound and real and important that they just think, mm -hmm. this is it. Like, this is what I should be focusing on. There's everything else seems like trivia, I guess, right, alongside <laughs> the mystical experience. Um, and that's why psychedelics are so wonderful, because they could democratize this, right? Instead of saying you have to be a a random person with the right neurochemistry to have a spontaneous mystical experience or you have to go off and starve yourself and meditate for years you know these psychedelics can actually help everybody achieve these states yeah uh, among the the letters that i've received in response to my book uh there have been some by people who have had spontaneous mystical experiences. And uh, one in particular sticks in my mind, a man who uh, considers that experience early in his life like the, uh, the anchor of his life, the most meaningful thing he can remember. But he had never even tried to verbalize it to his wife because he just didn't have any, he didn't have the words and he didn't want to be misunderstood or viewed as mentally ill. Or, so it, it was like this treasure he was holding within him. And somehow when he read my book, it gave him a language and a uh, sense of interconnectedness with other people uh, that allowed him to verbalize it for the first time wow. uh, late in life. But that made me very happy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's quite similar to my own um, my own story because I had a, a true stress mainly a uh, kind of spontaneous mystical experience at the age of thirteen, uh, which set my interest in all of this stuff. Um, and for about fifteen years, I barely told anyone about it um, because mm -hmm. everything you said, like you just think people. I mean, first off, you can't put it into words really, but unless you unpack a lot of yeah these different mm -hmm. things, timelessness, sacredness, feeling of kind of perfection in the way reality is unfolding um and it's only only over the last year or so that i've I ventured out to try and explain this to people um and yeah you, i think you, <laughs> this is why i'm now interviewing someone like you because your work is incredibly powerful in, in helping people to to unpack this yeah stuff. well we do the best we can james in the lang with words you know yeah. i sometimes think uh poetry and maybe music would express it even better you know, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it really stretches the limits of language and maybe uh, maybe it will uh, facilitate uh, some new, new developments in language. You know, yeah. I've often wondered if I knew Sanskrit, if I'd have a few extra <laughs> words right. uh, than I do in English, you know. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of words for these subtle alternative states of consciousness, you know? Yeah. And um, especially when we try to express things that are uh, kind of outside of time and cause and effect, because those are, those are the categories we think in, they organize our, our language and our cognitive processes.